For the last 50 or so days, we have been laser focused on the war in Ukraine. Our attention has been zeroed in on the atrocities that are taking place there at the hands of Vladimir Putin. It is estimated that nearly 5 million Ukrainians have fled since the beginning of the war. Thousands have been killed, and it's feared that thousands more may soon be added to that death toll. Kyiv is nearly 6,000 miles away from me in Miami, and sometimes it can feel like a world away. While the focus on Ukraine is certainly warranted, we also cannot lose sight of what is happening right here at home. We are dealing with the most polarized time in America in my entire lifetime, the battle of fact versus fiction, the fight for civility at a time of rampant incivility, and possibly being on the doorstep of the death of accountability, especially for the most powerful among us. There are a number of Republicans in Congress spewing outrageously false accusations that should make all of us concerned. They're throwing around disgusting tropes about pedophilia and groomers. At the same time, we have seen continued efforts to whitewash the Capitol insurrection, including Donald Trump himself vowing that he's going to seek justice for the January 6 prisoners before a crowd of cheering supporters. The January 6th committee's public hearings are supposed to happen sometime this spring, but there is no indication that Trump will actually be held accountable for what happened on January 6th, which, of course, is part of a trend with the former president. He certainly hasn't been held accountable in the past because nothing ever seems to stick. Which brings me back to my original point. Accountability is the key. And it's lacking in this country right now. Civility is important, but it's harder and harder to come by. So if anything, this war in Ukraine should remind us that we need to live up to our name. We are the United States of America. And instead, we are so divided. So my question is, how are we getting this so wrong at a time when we desperately need to get it right? And where do we go from here? Joining me now is someone who has been on the front lines fighting for accountability and for our democracy. Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He is on the Intelligence, Judiciary and Homeland Security Committees. He served as an impeachment manager for Donald Trump's second impeachment trial. Congressman, as always, I am grateful for you to take the time to be with us. Listen, you've been in Congress since 2013, almost 10 years ago. Oh, more, excuse me now. What's the environment like now at Capitol Hill compared to when you first got there? Right, well, good afternoon, Katie, and congratulations on the show. And, and thank you for bringing up this topic. It's one I care about a lot. Look, I'm the son of Republicans. I married a girl from southern Indiana who grew up with the Pence family. I went to Congress having beaten a Democrat promising to work uh, in that great big center where I think most of us live. And for four years, I did that. Uh, as a freshman in Congress, uh, I had more pieces of legislation signed into law than any other freshman Democrat because I worked with Republicans. And I enjoyed, you know, working in that space. And everything changed when Donald Trump was elected president. And it started like this. It started with the whispered conversations, you know, in committee rooms from Republicans saying, look, we don't really believe that. We don't like that he's saying this. And, and as one uh, Florida Republican uh, told me, uh, she said, the problem is when you speak out against him, you get your head lopped off on Twitter. And then it went from really being afraid to speak up to just leaning in and recognizing that the only path for them to stay in their jobs was to just enable it. And, and Katie, that's what's been so frustrating is there's a lack of people who are willing to risk their job to save their country. Now, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, Mitt Romney, uh, they are among the few, and they are uh, the exception, not the rule today in Washington. Yeah, but Congressman, uh, let's be clear. Trump's not in office anymore. In fact, he's not even on Twitter and most social media platforms. And so that opportunity or that platform from him to be able to maybe cut down some of your GOP colleagues seems to be gone. What is it that is still keeping your colleagues from being able to do the right thing? It's just a lack of courage. It's that they can't imagine themselves having another job. And that's so frustrating, right? Because when you get elected to Congress, you'd like to think you're serving with people who are otherwise employable and that this isn't the only job they could get. And then you quickly find 
that they're afraid of not being in Washington, not having the power. And, and you, you mentioned from at the top, this is the United States of America. And I really do believe that unity is the antidote here. And that if it's not just Kinzinger, Cheney and Romney, but other leaders banded together on their side, that that would be the antidote to Donald Trump. Because the country ultimately wants to be led. But when it's not led, when you're leading from behind and you're letting the mob rule, then the land of misfit toys like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Madison Cawthorn and company, they end up becoming the base. Uh, and then you see the country really, you know, degrade to the point where we're at today. Well, I'm glad you brought up that land of the misfit toys idea. You were quoted in a Vice article recently about the Democratic response to this insanity that we keep on seeing headlined all the time, right? These pedophile claims that the GOP, for example, is throwing around. And that quote is, I see polling that shows that that outrageous characterization is landing with some folks, but you also really don't want to give oxygen to the land of misfit toys, which is where this is coming from. I mean, you know, the land of misfit toys, Congressman, I take your point, right? But isn't there just some stuff that Democrats cannot let slide? This is not just some small slight. These are from very serious allegations. That's right, Katie. And I didn't mean to dismiss, you know, that we, we don't have an obligation to, mm -hmm. to speak out as for what we're for. And by the way, they're often projecting, right, that this is a party uh, through Donald Trump that projects every day. And the leader of the land of misfit toys is the senior Republican on the Judiciary Committee, who, oh, by the way, was the wrestling coach at a program that had multiple sexual assaults under, you know, his supervision while he was there. And he refuses to talk about it, won't take any responsibility for it. I also believe that recently a Republican National Committee official, uh, you know, pleaded guilty to child pornography related charges. So it seems that they are projecting it. And maybe we do need to start punching back a little bit harder. Uh, and by the way, isn't a colleague of mine no longer running uh, because he got caught uh, in an affair with an ISIS bride? So, you know, keep accusing us of what you're doing. And, and I think we all need to start punching back harder, uh, but also contrasting that this is the difference between chaos and competence. They will bring the country chaos if they have the opportunity to govern. We are trying to take on inflation, rising gas prices, you know, increased crime across America, but also make sure that the rescue plan reaches restaurants and businesses hurt by the pandemic. And oh yes, we just put on the Supreme Court a black woman for the first time ever so that the court starts to look more like America. So they are chaos, we're competence, and we have to make that clear. So you, like many others, were elected to go to Washington because people wanted you to fight to make all American lives better, not just those, not just those for your constituents, for example. Given the roadblocks that you're facing, how are you effectively carrying out your mission and that perhaps of others? Well, I, I still try and collaborate where I can. As I said, I, my DNA, being the son of two Republicans, has always been to try and find consensus. And so the leader of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, Tom Emmer and I, we both chair a precision medicine caucus. And we're trying to make sure that every child at birth has access to genetic sequencing. And then we've written legislation together that will get us closer to that. Uh, before Don Young passed away, you know, the dean of the House, uh, he and I were leading the effort on rare earth elements and countering China's ability to, you know, control and, and price gouge around those elements that go into making iPhones, jet engines, and, and missile defense systems. So I'm going to keep doing that, Katie, but I'm not going to be silent when I see Republicans enabling, you know, corruption at the very top of their party uh, through Donald Trump, as long as he's still around. Unity is key to be able to move forward and get things done. Democrats currently have the control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. But what are you going to say to your constituents, for example, who are frustrated with the lack of productivity that they perceive coming from Democrats in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, we're getting things done and we're fixing the problems that, you know, are hurting Americans. And by the way, contrast where we were just two years ago, steeped in a pandemic. You know, we were isolated on the world stage as far as global affairs and how they affected America. Today, you know, nearly 70 percent of Americans are vaccinated. We funded the effort to get businesses back up on their feet, Americans back to their jobs, back to their churches, their kids back in school. And then also look at the infrastructure bill. Uh, as President Biden said in his uh, State of the Union that we invested to connect the disconnected in ways that were promised for four years and were never delivered. 
the COMPETES Act, which is going to fund semiconductor, semiconductor chips and building more of that in America to counter China, that will be passed and signed into law probably in the next month. And yes, on inflation, we are doing all we can to you know, understand the problem. Uh, proposals out there right now include you know, a gas rebate by you know, putting a windfall tax on gasoline companies, uh, as well as we just refunded the restaurant relief grant program, and hopefully the Senate will pass that as well. And what do the Republicans want to do, Katie? Well, the Republicans have said in their own rescue plan for America through Senator Scott, who's leading their effort, that millions of more Americans will pay more in taxes while the rich continue to pay less if they have, if they are governing in Washington next year. Congressman, you make a very compelling case for what the Democrats have been able to accomplish. But the conventional, I'll put in quotes, conventional wisdom is that Democrats are going to lose in the fast approaching November midterms. Call it right now. Are they right or are they wrong? They're wrong. And actually, we bucked the conventional wisdom already because we were supposed to already be mathematically eliminated at this point because mm -hmm. of redistricting. Uh, every conventional, uh, you know, pr every conventional pundit out there was saying that Democrats uh, would already lose 10 to 15 seats because of redistricting. Because we went to the courts through Eric Holder, Mark Elias, and others, we have beaten back Republican voter suppression uh, efforts, and we are expected to net four to six seats. Uh, after all is said and done with the core challenges in redistricting. So we're not going to lose because of redistricting. We're not going to lose because of candidates. We've got great candidates out there. One I'll put on your radar, a Navy veteran, uh, first-generation Ghanaian-American, Quay Corte, running in a seat in L.A. County that we lost by 300 votes. Quay is going to Congress. So we've got great credentialed candidates. We're not going to lose because of money. There's no donor f fatigue. We're seeing that quarter after quarter, we are beating Republicans in our fundraising. So we've got redistricting on our side. We've got great candidates. We're going to have the money to fund the get out the vote efforts. And when voters compare chaos to competence, violence to voting, and indecency to integrity, they're going to choose us. Congressman Eric Swalwell, thank you for wanting to achieve the accountability that we're so desperately trying to ensure still exists. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Kate.